Don't watch me again. Don't, don't do that. But What If by Matthew West, and do it with the rap version. And I know some of you go, oh, rap, oh, rap, oh, rap. But as I told you, or sort of intimated last week, you know, rap was not my thing for the longest time until I saw Hamilton. Who has seen Hamilton live in here? Yes, I know. Were you a fan of rap be no. before? Are you now? No. Okay. <laughs> Wasn't that absolutely superb? Absolutely superb. And so I uh, suggest that, you know, Matthew West, what if, and I'm just going to keep playing it week after week after week. And then the second song, which we'll not be able to do at the end of the service, is going to be another one by Charity Gale. And it's written, if you get the handout, I've got handouts here, and I'll try and do that every week. But it's featuring Stephen Muso, one of the people in Vang, and the band. It's called I Speak Jesus. It's absolutely wonderful. That song, I Speak Jesus, is absolutely wonderful and pertains, I think, to today's lesson. So, let's start. May we open with prayer. Gracious Lord, do you know what you want? each and every one of us to learn, including me. Father, as we talk about the history of Scripture, this Bible, open our eyes, open our hearts, and let us know more about you so that we can tell others. Amen. All right, just a little review from last week for those of you that were here or watched it or are watching it now or are hearing it for the first time. You know, in the first lesson on the history of the Bible, I really asked the questions, who, what, where, when, and why? When did the Bible begin? And I asked that question and many people responded, well, it begins in Genesis. And I was very careful to ask the question, when did the Bible begin? Not what's in the beginning of the Bible because I tried to make a point last week. That's not where it started. Genesis is not where the beginning of the history of our Bible started. And some of you are looking at me and your eyes just got narrow. Yes, Gary, it does. Well, let's talk about this, okay? Let's talk about this because truly when Jesus rose from the dead. And then Christianity spread. There was no Bible. There was no Bible. There were Jewish scriptures. But Christians weren't Jewish. They came from a Jewish background or a Gentile background, but they weren't Jewish. In fact, as we'll find out later, I hope, when the early Christians were spreading that word, they were assaulted on two fronts. The Romans didn't like what they were doing. And the Sanhedrin, the ruling class of the Jews, did not like what they were doing. They did not want Christians to have the Jewish scriptures. So in the beginning, there was no Bible. What's up with that? Because truly, you've always had it. And you have always had it, which is, I think, if you look at it, it's been chaptered, it's been versed, there are little helps at the bottom to help you as you go through it, there are maps, and there's pictures, and there's everything else at the end, but that wasn't the case with the first Christians, and we're talking the first Christians, there was no Bible. So, how did it come about? Where did it start? And I want to go back right to that key event. Because truly, when Jesus was crucified, everybody, including the closest people to him, his disciples, his mother, 
expected him to stay dead because nobody, nobody survives a Roman crucifixion. In fact, if you take a look at the scriptures that we have now, when we start talking about that wonderful history of Jesus, which we find in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, one of the big tells for Jesus being dead was they stuck that spear in his side and blood and water flowed out, which is a clear indication of death. Nobody, and I mean nobody, according to history, survives a Roman crucifixion. Jesus was dead. When Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus went to take his body down off the cross, they got permission to do this, to put him in a new tomb. And they didn't know it at the time, but we know it now, according to scripture. They were fulfilling prophecy. When they took him down, both of them expected him to stay dead. When the women, whoever they were, went to the tomb the first time, they had spices prepared because they couldn't go and really do things with his body because of the Sabbath coming up. They were doing that so that he wouldn't smell so bad when they got back in three days. They expected him to stay dead. But he didn't. And they saw. And I'm telling you, I want you to regauge your thinking, even if you don't agree with me, and it's okay not to agree with me. Our history of the Bible starts with the resurrection. Because that's when the disciples and others, which I hope to show you today, saw Jesus alive. And nobody, nobody, nobody comes back from the dead. No one. So what happened? What happened to make very fearful disciples, 11 now because Judas has hanged himself, in that room, afraid for their lives because they thought the same thing was going to happen to them that happened to Jesus. They were there, afraid for their lives. What took them from also very, very disappointed people? Can you just imagine spending three years with somebody and hearing all these wonderful things, seeing all these wonderful things, and now your leader's dead? which means the movement is dead and you're going to be persecuted because the Jews aren't going to stop with just Jesus. They're going to come after you too because you are part of it. So what took them from fearing for their lives to having no fear? It's a big deal. They had no fear of death, of their own death. Before they were afraid for their lives, afterwards they weren't. What was the difference? And the difference was somebody came back from the dead and Jesus told them where he was going. And now comes the rest of the story, okay? How many of you are hearing this for the first time? not about the resurrection, but where the history of the Bible started. How many of you are hearing this for the first time? I would be raising my hand also. And again, I just want you to listen. And as I said last week, you know, as a classroom teacher, 38 years in the classroom, I always appreciated, and it took a lot to confront me, because of how I taught, I always appreciated when those students could bite back, I called it, and said, look, I don't agree with this. I knew I had them. And what did I have? I had them thinking. I just want you to think. 
about this wonderful faith that you have in Christ Jesus. And that question that I have asked three times now, I want you to think about what made those, what allowed those disciples to go from fear of their lives to having no fear of death. And I'm going to tell you, it's because they saw their Lord and Savior, their leader, crucified and come back. Now, they had hope for something. They heard Jesus say over and over and over, the kingdom of heaven is like. The kingdom of heaven is like. So let's go to... Um, would you go to Acts 2.32? Here it is. By the way, who wrote Acts? Are you sure? How many of you know who wrote the book of Acts? You say, Luke, how do you know he wrote the book of Acts? How do you know Luke wrote Luke, right? Because he's named Luke, yeah. <laughs> God has raised his Jesus to life, and we are all, and here is the key. They were witnesses. There was no Bible for two centuries, three centuries almost. Why? It's a great question, isn't it? You go, well, there, were, there, were, there was the Old Testament. No. Those were Jewish scriptures. The Old Testament got pulled in later. It is a wonderful, wonderful reason why the Old Testament got pulled in. It wasn't by the Jews. It was by the Gentiles. They're the ones that pulled in the Old Testament scripture. Why? I hope your interest is piqued. P-I-Q-U-E-D. Okay? I hope you're thinking about all this. And again, you don't have to agree. So, let's take a look at the 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 8, okay? And if you would like to follow along in whatever version of the Bible that you would like to, if I keep telling you, what I have been reading is the Amplified, which gives more explanation. This is from the NIV. Now, brothers, I want to remind you, and who wrote Corinthians? Who wrote Corinthians? Are you sure? Now you're going, I'm not sure of anything right now. Yes, of course, Paul wrote Corinthians. He wrote the letters. And I've had people, I had a minister, not, not Pastor Bob or Pastor David, tell me, well, we really don't know who wrote the Pauline letters. I'm going, really? Okay, all right. Now, brothers, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which you received and on which you have taken your stand. By this gospel, you are saved. If, love that word if, 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 you hold firmly to the word which I preached to you. Otherwise, your belief is in vain or you believed in vain. For what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance. This is, Paul is saying, pay attention. This is of first importance here, because Paul said a lot of things. That Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. Which scriptures? Which scriptures? Interesting. Paul didn't know when he was writing these letters that was going to get compiled into the Bible. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John didn't know that it would get compiled into the Bible. What scriptures are he talking about? They didn't write them to get compiled into the Bible that we have today. Why did they write them? Another question for you. It says that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures, and that he appeared to Peter and then to the 12. After that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers at the same time. 
Paul is telling you and me and anybody that would read this letter, there's more than 500 people out there who have seen Jesus after he was resurrected, not before, after. After. Though some have, I love this term, fallen asleep. If you fall asleep, what does it mean you eventually will do? You're going to, you're going to wake up, right? If you've fallen asleep, this is a huge turning point of belief. Even for Paul, remember? Paul was a Pharisee. And they didn't believe, all of them, in the resurrection. And now he does. They didn't believe in an afterlife. They didn't believe, all of them, in a kingdom of heaven. This is a big deal. Because now, he is saying, many who have fallen asleep, which means, hmm, they're going to wake up. And if we keep going, then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, and last of all, he appeared to me also. Do you remember when he appeared to Paul? He's going down that road, and what's he doing? He's part of the Sanhedrin. Remember I told you they were persecuted on two fronts, the Romans, we'll get into why, and the Jews, and he's part of that Jewish persecution. He had orders. They gave him orders to round them up and bring them back and stick them in prison. Any of these Christians, get them out of here. We want this movement over. So, what happened? What's next? Okay, keep going. Would you please, Dodie? <clears throat> yeah, I want you to think about that. Keep going. Are you sure Luke wrote that? I would encourage you to read the beginning of Luke. Why is Luke writing his letter? All it is is a history of Jesus. Why is Luke writing it? He's writing it for someone who commissioned him called Theophilus. It's right in Luke. And if you go to the beginning of Acts, and I, you don't have this, Dodi, okay? If you go to the beginning of Acts, it says, in my former book, Theophilus, this is the beginning of Acts. In my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day he was taken up into heaven. Yeah, Luke wrote this. Of course he did. Why? And the great part about Luke was if we take a timeline of when Jesus, Jesus was crucified and rose, 30 to 33 AD, because we tell time by when Jesus was born, right? By the way, Christianity has shaped civilization. It has absolutely shaped modern day civilization. It hinges on Christianity. So our timeline, they're about 33 AD. Jesus was crucified and rose. They can go back as early as 50 AD and find letters attributed to Luke. That is such a short window of time. And that means when Luke says, I interviewed eyewitnesses, which is right in the beginning of Luke. You can take that as historical fact. Luke was not one of the disciples. He was a Gentile physician, by the way. And of course, in that day, very few people were educated, very few people could read and write. 
most, if not all, of the disciples being Galilean fishermen and the like, they couldn't read, they couldn't write. They would have gone out and done their jobs at a very early stage in life. Can you imagine? Now let's go back. Matthew, can you imagine when Jesus called Matthew and what was Matthew's vocation at the time he called him? What was he? Hated. Beyond belief. Can you imagine the disciples going, what are you doing, Jesus? Don't you understand? Only Samaritans are hated more. Only Samaritans, which we'll get into next week. Only Samaritans. What's he doing here? Do you know there is no bigger traitor in Jerusalem than Matthew? Because the way he would make his money, he would be commissioned by Rome to collect Roman taxes. And the only way he could make money, because all the taxes he had collected would have to go back to Rome, was to charge extra on top of that. The Jews hated him. He had been outcast from the temple. And he was taking their money. He was hated. Can you imagine when Jesus brought him in? But now let's think. What did Matthew have that none of the other disciples probably had? He could read and write. And Matthew took the message of salvation to the Jews because he was a Jew. In fact, I encourage you to read all of Matthew. The men's Bible study is going through Matthew right now, the Monday night Bible study. And the wonderful thing about Matthew, his point of view is all Jewish. He is pulling from Old Testament scriptures, scripture after scripture after scripture, not to encourage the Christians to live a Jewish life, which we'll get into, but to show them how much the Jewish scriptures have influenced Christianity. And then Matthew as soon as it, was, as it was written, not too long after Luke, because historically they go back and they find these letters, not the Bible. There's no Bible there. There's no Bible. There's just these wonderful letters. And even Luke says, many, in, in verse 1, chapter 1, verse 1, he says, many have undertaken to draw up an account of the things that have been fulfilled among us. He knows he's not the only one. And Matthew wrote this, and it's almost as soon as it was written, it was translated into Greek. Why? Why would something that's going to the Jews be translated into Greek immediately? Because they find the Jewish, and then they find the Greek. Why? Tell me. Why? Right? It was the language of the known world. Greek was the accepted language of the world, known world, even by the Romans. So it got translated so it could be spread. Really cool. Okay. All right. And then we and then we go to Mark. Would you go to where it says keep going? Keep going. Yeah. Peter was a fisherman. He couldn't have written it. As I've, as I've studied, Galilean fishermen were just absolutely coarse, rough-talking, old salts, even though they weren't old, foul-mouthed. Do you want me to keep going? Uneducated. And this is from history beyond the Bible. This is who Galilean fishermen were. Peter probably couldn't read and write. But he hooked up with a person called John Mark, who was another Greek. 
And as I keep encouraging you to read the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you read the Gospel of Mark, you can definitely see these short clipped verses as if a Galilean fisherman were dictating what happened. This, 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 and this. I love Mark. Because it gets you from A to B very fast. Read it. It's the shortest gospel, which makes sense because it's being dictated to John Mark, Mark, by Peter. And again, this isn't coming just from Christians. This is coming from outside. People are saying, are writing about, and there are many historians of the day, writing about the fact that John, Mark, and Peter spent a lot of time together. So now we've got, we've got Luke, we have Matthew, we have Mark. All written within a short time frame of each other. How, how does that now? Because just as soon as these letters were written, they were copied meticulously and circulated. There's no Bible. There's no compilation. They're just these letters. And Christianity is exploding. Even though they are being persecuted by the Roman Empire and persecuted by the Jews, Christianity is exploding. How can Christianity explode if there's no Bible? Now, I've done a lot of talking up here. I'd like to know your reason. How could Christianity explode if there's no Bible? What would make me as a Gentile or as a quote, God-fearing Jew, even want to know about this. Because Judaism is a closed religion. Very much so. It is closed. Jews didn't mix. They didn't mingle. In fact, 15 years after Peter saw Jesus rise from the dead, he still wouldn't go into a Gentile home because you didn't mix. Jesus sort of had to, in a vision, had to take him and go, <laughs> Peter, get in there. There are people that are waiting for you. Had to bring down, remember, the sheets full of unclean animals. Remember this? And as soon as that vision was over, bang, there's a knock at his door. And even with all of this, with all of these things, he gets to this Gentile home and he goes, you know, I'm really not supposed to be here. You know my custom. You're considered unclean. Can you imagine saying that to somebody? But that's what Acts records. But God has shown me that what I consider unclean no longer is. So what's going on? What's happening? How does this get spread so fast? I'm going to keep coming back, and I want, I want an answer. I want this to be a little bit more interactive. What would make you change from Christianity to something else? Because that's what was being asked of everybody in the ancient world. What would make you change? I didn't see it. I, 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 I didn't see it. Heard about it, but I didn't see it. Okay. All right. Threat of persecution. The testimony of those 
who saw Jesus rise from the dead. I understand I'm not there. Not enough for me. Jackie? Jackie said miracles. Good for you. Now say something more about it, would you please? The miracles that Jesus did, and after he was resurrected, I'm going to add some more things to it. Is that okay? All right. Now, if you don't want this, you just let me know. All right. These disciples, after they received the Holy Spirit, were on fire. They were healing. They were actually bringing people back from death to life. The blind could see, the deaf could hear, not just when Jesus was there, but also the disciples were doing it after he went back into heaven. I keep saying it's not necessarily what's being said, it's what's being seen and done. These disciples, now exploding, were performing miracles on a daily basis. They went right into the teeth of the lion right after they received the Holy Spirit. The same people that crucified Christ, had Christ crucified. The Sanhedrin and, you know, the Roman cohort. They went right back and they started preaching and they looked right at him and they said, the one you had crucified, knowing that they were probably going to be put to death for. So again, I ask you, what happened? What happened? But the Sanhedrin couldn't touch them because they were doing miracles and the people saw it. And the Sanhedrin said, whoa, we'll, we'll have a riot here if we even put these people in prison. Read Acts. Read the history of the church. Read Matthew, Mark, Luke. John, Acts. This is our history. And before you say, well, Gary, you're negating the Old Testament, I am not at all. But the reason for the Old Testament being part of our scriptures might be different than you think. Do I believe it all to be true? Yes. Do I believe that there are parts in the Old Testament that still are going to come true? Yes. Do I believe every last story and synopsis in the Old Testament to be true? Yes. Do I believe the story of creation? Do I believe? Yes, 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 and yes. But make no bones about it. The Old Testament scriptures weren't the reason for people coming to Christ. It was not the reason. And there was no Bible. There was none. There were these wonderful letters being circulated. That's it. So, besides the miracles, what else would cause you to change your mind? And I want you to think in terms of giving up your Christianity for something different. And you're going, well, I would never give up my Christianity. Well, consider... The Jews would say they wouldn't give up their Judaism. And these Gentiles would not give up their gods. It was part of their everyday life. It was part of who they were. So what happened? Patrick, go ahead. And, and so what is 
only not to the God. There's no exception. But you can not be in it. You cannot be satisfied with what you see. Did everybody hear that? Patrick, would you stand up? I'm, I'm going to, um, because you just gave next week's lesson. I love it. <laughs> I love it when somebody does that. I, I just, Emily, would you come on up here and say, or you can stand up and say the same thing, only do it louder so everybody can hear. Are we okay with what he had to say? Don't discount the spoken word, he says. And. You still haven't given me one more thing. There's one more thing. There's one more thing to get added in here. Why people change. The Holy Spirit was at work, which I think is a lot of what you're saying, Patrick. Don't you think? Yeah. The indwelling of the Holy Spirit was at work. Oh, my gosh. The third person of the Trinity, and as I keep telling you, don't ask me to explain the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit and how everything goes. Someday I'll know. Maybe you know. Maybe you can tell me. But this is a hard one for me. Very difficult for me. But I know what the Spirit has done in my life. Both. Helping me and Remember, it's called the sword of the spirit. And a sword is meant to slice and dice. I have been sliced and diced by this spirit on more than one occasion because I needed it. So remember, it's both things. So now we have Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, or not John. John wasn't written until 85, 90 AD. Do you know why? Someone tell me why John was written so far after the other three Gospels. Every disciple was martyred, except... And I'm not quite sure why John wasn't martyred. But remember, it's, Jesus predicted that. Remember when they were on the beach? Peter asked the question, what about him? Jesus said, nope, not going to see death. Like you. And I'm really paraphrasing it. Not going to see death like you. Besides, that's none of your business. John was exiled to Pat. Because they needed John to shut up. They needed to get rid of John and not kill him. My understanding, they needed to get rid of John without killing him because the people would have absolutely gone berserk. He and James, the half-brother of Jesus, were really the head of this church. And even though they were being persecuted, they were revered by the people. So they exiled him. They just wanted him away and to shut up. I think there was another reason for it. Because if you look at the Gospel of John, how many of you have heard this statement? If John were the only Gospel, the only letter you had, John's letter would be the only one you need to follow Christ. How many of you have heard that? In fact, when many of you first became Christian, wasn't John where you were directed to go? How many of you are in, in that? Raise your hand. I want to know. How many of you, when you first became Christian, you were first directed to John? Absolutely. Why? Why is that? What is it about John as opposed to the other three letters, Matthew, Mark, and Luke? What is it about John? Of course, we love John 3.16, don't we? 
And why was John 3.16 stated? What was happening at that point? It's a wonderful story of Nicodemus. And read around it. There's even more being said. David, you wanted to say something. Thank you. You just gave lesson number four. Good for you. I love it. All right. In case you didn't hear, the first three Gospels told the history and the facts behind Jesus. The Gospel of John told, I don't want to put words in your mouth. What did you say? Of his feelings and his love. For God so loved the world that he that John was just absolutely clear on eternal life. And then this wonderful passage, which you, I, I know, I am so far, I, you and I are so far apart right now, right? Can we go to John 14, 6? How many of you can quote John 14, 6? People don't like this. I love this. I love this. You say, well, you're just pulling this out, Gary. Oh. He's grabbing the feeling of it right here. I'm the way. I'm the truth. I'm the light. No one comes to the Father except through me. And I want to know what that through me means. And he tells people. He tells people. John writes this letter. Again, he doesn't know that it's going to be compiled. He has no clue that other letters from Paul and Peter and Jude and are going to all be, and the Old Testament scriptures are going to, and then we're going to do chapter and verse. We're going to put some in red lettering and we're going to have maps and we're going to have all this. That's not why he wrote this letter. But he tells us what, exactly why he's writing this letter. He is an old, old man at this point. And I think it finally hits him. I better write some of this stuff down or have somebody write it down for me. Remember, John was a fisherman too. So here we go. If you want to follow along, John 20, verses 30 and 31. Here it is. Here it is. Here's why he wrote this letter. Jesus did many other miraculous signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded of in this book. Yeah, maybe some made it into Matthew, Mark, and Luke, but there's a lot of stuff here, guys. But these are written that you may what? He says, you know what? Now I'm putting words in his mouth. I'm getting old. This can't just stop with, this can't stop with me. I have to get it written down. That you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and by what? Believing you may have life in his name. And that life in Greek means everlasting life. And he doesn't stop. Let's go on to the next one. This is not the whole story. This is just part of the story. But if the Gospel of John was all that you had, it would have been all that was needed. So, what happens now? We have these four letters, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and Acts. We've got those, but no Bible. 
No one's asked me the question yet. When did the first Bible even come into publication? Does anyone know? You don't count because you're in seminary. No, I'm kidding. Does, does anyone know when the first Bible was compiled? Wow, pretty good. Almost 300 years passed before there's even a compilation. So how did this all happen? And please understand the gospel, the good news, this movement is absolutely spreading like wildfire. And I'm here to tell you, I gotta watch my time, I know I do. Oh, crap. Are you telling me four more minutes? Can I do five? If I keep talking, can I do six? No, I'm kidding. Here's, here's what I want to leave you with. You know, some of you read your Bibles. Some of you don't. Some of you do it sometimes. Some of you don't. I'm not, I am not judging. But here's how it was for the first and second century Christians. Rome was furious with the Christians. Rome could have cared less what you believed in. You could have any religion you want if you did two things. Well, they like those taxes, yeah. But if they did two things, number one, they paid homage to the Roman gods. And number two, they would say that Caesar was their Lord. The early Christians refused to do either. And so whenever something went wrong in the Roman Empire, guess who got blamed? And guess who got, quote, fed to the lions and burned at the stake and everything else? Because they refused to pay homage to to the Roman gods, offer grain offerings and things that they required of everybody and declare that Caesar was Lord. And in the second century, there was a Roman emperor who even went so far as to write the edicts of saying, round them up, round up all their literature and get rid of them. And so, many Christians went to their death protecting. Yes. Not the Bible, but those precious letters that were circulating, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John, and by then the letters of Paul, they went to their death by just awful means protecting this so you could have it. So now I'm gonna lay a little guilt on you. You tell me you do not have enough time to read this because when the Roman soldiers entered your home and found one of these letters, they were very particular on how they killed people. It was your wife first and then your male children, then your female ch children, while you watched. And then it was you. And, and hundreds, thousands refused to pay homage to the gods and to bow down to Caesar. And in so doing, keep these precious letters alive. So you tell me, knowing your history now, tell me, the blood of people kept this for you. I think for me, I'm going to read it. What was so important here that they would give their very lives for it? So what do you think? What do you think? Because I'd like to continue next week with this entire story. 
I want to start right where I've left off and I want to add to what Patrick had to say and then I want to add in week four of what Pastor David had to say. And by the way, I want you to know that you cut me right to the heart with your sermon because that passage that comes out where it says, better for a millstone to be hung around your neck than to lead one of these little ones astray. I take that to heart. I will not lead anybody astray on purpose. And if you think I am, I need to know it. Let's pray. Gracious Lord, you have given us these precious scriptures, these scriptures that the early Christians considered valuable and reliable and sacred and inspired by you. They went to their deaths rather than call anyone but you, Lord. And Father, we know that we are not asked to do that today, but we are asked to have the moral courage to stand up for you. Amen. Thank you.